Welcome to Rock Talk with Jackie Neal. In this episode, we're speaking with Kirby Warnock from Fort Stockton, Texas. He is a music aficionado and a filmmaker. His latest film is Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan, Brothers in Blues, available on all major streaming platforms except Netflix. Now, this film is in Incredible. And let's dive right in and talk about it. Kirby, how did you come to make this? Because me personally, I couldn't just pick up the phone and set up interviews with Billy Gibbons and Eric Clapton and Jackson Brown and some of the other heavy hitters you have in this film talking about Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Well, all those celebrity or classic rock icon interviews, I was able to get them only through Jimmy Vaughan. Most people don't understand this, but both the Vaughan brothers are tremendously respected respected by all the greatest guitar players and recorded artists around. Uh, I don't think people understand how much that they are admired by people like Eric Clapton and Jackson Brown and Billy Gibbons and uh, Jeff Beck even. Unfortunately, Jeff Beck died. Yeah. I was able to get those. The biggest get was getting Jimmy to cooperate with me because if you ever go and Google all of Steve Ray Vaughan, Jimmy's never cooperated on any film or even really a book. He cooperated a little bit on this uh, one Texas flood that's put out by the guys that work for guitar guitar player, but he didn't really uh, get into that very heavily. And he's always uh, just said no when people try to get him to cooperate or anything about Stevie. So all these books and documentaries are already out there. We're done without his cooperation. Yeah. And I am been watching the Vaughn Brothers since 1977 when I was reporting for Buddy Magazine and developed a friendship with Jimmy, mainly as, as a writer. I go to all his gigs and like that. And I just really felt that we had to have his voice to make this uh, legitimate documentary because uh, he and he knew Stevie better than anybody. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you say. They shared a little tiny bedroom together. They He taught Stevie how to play his first song on the guitar. And so not having his voice was just an oversight. And then when I got Jimmy on board, I wanted to interview those people, and he personally contacted them and said, talk to this guy, he's okay. And so I never would have gotten any of those without Jimmy's cooperation, and and that's how that all happened. And, of course, we're talking about Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan, Brothers in Blues, now available on all major streaming platforms. And it came out in theatrical release, too. I know you premiered it in Austin. Kirby, this film is amazing. The way you edited it, the interviews, and just the unseen photographs and footage and just things that most people like me, being fans, had no idea about. Right. And that was what I was approaching this as, because everybody's got a different opinion about Stevie and like that. But I just wanted to tell what I saw. I'm like, okay, watching these guys for 45 years, here's what I saw. Yeah. And then I tried to track down all these stories I'd heard about them, because you know, going to their gigs and all that, there'd always be somebody you were standing next to who said, did you know that Jimmy Vaughn opened for Jimi Hendrix when he was only 15 years old? Or did you know that uh, Jackson Brown gave Steve Ray Vaughn his recording studio for free yeah. to record Texas Flood? And I wanted to track down all those stories I'd heard and put it together that way. And I was trying very hard to bring new information. I was trying to show stuff people had not seen before or not you know, heard before because every concert and every recording and every interview Stevie Ray Vaughan ever did is now on the internet. If you search for it, you find it there. And I thought, I don't want to pull that stuff and give people the same thing that's already out there. I want new stuff and I want it only from people who were in the room when it happened. Mm-hmm. I don't want to interview critics or experts explaining the importance of Stevie Ray Vaughan. I want to talk to Eric Clapton about, okay, you were with Stevie the night he died. Tell me what happened, you know. Yeah. Same thing with Jim. And then Jackson Brown, you gave your studio to Stevie Ray Vaughan and then recorded the first album. Tell me how that came about. What happened? And so I had to get the people who were actually there, who were president of the creation, and get what we call in, this, in history, we call it primary evidence. You know, not testimony or hearsay, but I wanted to get firsthand information. And that was what I really was trying to do with this film is give people the real deal, you know, and stuff they had never seen before. I'm from Fort Worth and my brother, Mike, he grew up around Jimmy and Stevie Ray and he's been friends with Jimmy throughout the years. They were all 
together in that budding music scene in Oak Cliff, that whole Dallas-Fort Worth area in the 60s when Cliff Radio Station was so ingrained in how the kids were listening to music, what they were listening to, the radio programs. As a radio person, it still just blows my mind the reach that radio signals had back then. That was what I was trying to do in this film is is because there's a whole generation that wasn't even alive when Stevie was still playing. He's been dead 31 years. Yeah. And I was trying to give them a sense of time and place about what it was like when Jimmy and Stevie were, you know, starting out. And it was a different time and a different place. And and, and you know that, but I've got a whole, we got a whole generation that never remembered a time without the internet or mm-hmm. a cell phone. Right. And, and so back then, radio for us as kids, that was it. You know, that was the only way to listen to our peers or our music. And because uh, a lot of us lived in small towns, we had to listen to these powerful stations at night when they boosted their signal and all like that. And that was the only way we could hear rock and roll. I grew up in South Mississippi and all that we had on the radio there was gospel or country and Western. Yeah. At night I could pick up WLS out of Chicago and listen to that. And then when I you know, was coming out to Fort Stockton, I could pick up KLF at night out here too. So man, I lived for the nighttime to put my little transistor radio <laughs> by my head and, and listen to rock and roll <laughs> and people talking about it even. You know, that was like in a music desert, you know, growing yeah. up. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of us were, and the music we grew up on was what Jimmy and Stevie Ray grew up on with their parents taking them to the honky tonks because that's what we grew up doing where we grew up on all of the jukebox country music. Yes. When we ever we drove out to Fort Stockton when I was a kid, my dad always had the, he had control of the radio because he was driving. <laughs> right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up listening to Marty Robbins, mm-hmm. uh, Bob Wills, Eddie Arnold, uh, Jim Leaves, you know, Johnny Cash, early Johnny Cash on Sun Records. And that's what I grew up listening to in my house. Uh, but then when I got to be about, you know, 11 or 12, that's when I started gravitating more. It all changed the Beatles. The film talks about when the Beatles happened, that's when that musical awareness for people like, especially Jimmy, because he was older, their band, The Chessmen, and Billy Gibbons with the Moving Sidewalks, his band in Houston. Let's talk about that correlation with the Chessmen and the Moving Sidewalks and how Billy Gibbons came to know Jimmy and later Stevie Ray. I was mainly wanting to talk to Billy about when Stevie Ray dropped by and, and sat in with uh, ZZ Top when they were at Arthur's. But he said, no, no, I've known Stevie and Jimmy since I was 15 years old. You know, when we had that band, the Moving Sidewalks, the Chessmen were playing too. And, you know, uh, bands kind of always check each other out. You know, they're kind of just kind of a competition there yeah. but he told me that they used to go see them play and I never knew they played a double bill in Houston with the Chessman and Jimmy Vaughn on a double bill with with Billy Gibbons and the moving sidewall back when they were both like 15 years old you know right and so I never knew that story but but Billy had become a fan of Jimmy's and Stevie's going back to when he was 15 and when they were playing in, in you know, just little bar bands or like that. And so they kind of had a mutual admiration society. They were both the hot young guitar players from Texas, and they had both opened for Jimi Hendrix, which blows my mind. You're, you're two 15-year-old kids who each were uh, openers for Hendrix, yeah. one in Dallas. One in Houston. And so they had a long time um, admiration society. And uh, I became aware of that, you know, working on the film. And uh, that was one of those aha moments and when we were doing the interviews. And I put it in there. It was like, I didn't know this. And I bet a buttload of people don't know this. Well, I sure didn't. And also, you know, them talking about the formation of Blue Mondays at the Rome Inn. And, you know, Billy Gibbons talking about, like you hit on, the music pre-cell phone, pre-MTV, pre-social media days. Everything was word of mouth. And so when somebody showed up to see you, it's because they heard about you and they wanted to see you. Right. And you had to get out of your living room. Yeah. (laughs) You couldn't couldn't watch it on YouTube. You had to go down there and be there to be a part of it, you know. So that was just the, it it required you to, (laughs) what we call now FaceTime, Mm -hmm. to have FaceTime with people. You had to get down there and be in the room when all this stuff happened because it was going to happen that one night, then it was over. Nobody could record it. There were no cell phones. 
So if you you wanted to be in that moment. You you were thinking there's going to be something cool happening here, and I want to be there. And it's like Jimmy told me a long time ago. And he's funny. He goes, look, when we're playing, it's be there or be square. Jimmy talking about no wonder you know they were all too young to drive. No wonder their dads all kind of fought over who was going to drive the boys to their gigs because God, you know, yeah, we're driving our 15 year old sons to open for Hendrix. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a mind blowing thing there. It that, is. Uh, they, that he and Stevie were too young to drive anywhere, and the bandmates had to pick them up, or their dads, you know. Yeah. Like that. That's the thing. I was trying very hard to give that sense of time and place to show why it was so different. And also, I like to say it was a lot harder to get famous back then. Now we have tons of people who are famous who have no talent. They're all mm-hmm. over friggin' YouTube or TikTok or whatever. I mean, the Kartrashians, you know. These are again people with no talent, but they're famous, you know. And and back then, you had to have talent, and you had to be able to get up on a stage and do it to get famous. You know, now you can sit in your buddy basement and just record videos and become an influencer. You know, I, I don't, I don't get it, but you know, again, I'm older. But uh, that was the biggest difference to me was that you had to be. You had to have, actually have a talent to become famous back then. I love that we're talking about details of the film because it doesn't take anything away from it. You have just got to watch the film. It is amazing, the interviews. And to me, for me, the photographs were so incredible. Yeah. Now, a lot of those, those black and white photos, I took those when I was at Buddy Magazine. So we have a ton of photos that have never been seen before because I used them in the movie. I shot a bunch of them uh, when I was covering, you know, both of Vaughn Brothers and Buddy. And and back then, I, I told, I've told Every interviewer I've had, and everybody asks me about it. I- I'm just telling you, the first time I saw these guys, I thought, oh, my God, they are incredible. Why aren't they famous? Working for Buddy, I got to go to every rock show. I saw Jimmy Page play in person. I saw Robin Trower. I saw Eric Clapton and Mike Hoopel. I saw all those great guitarists play in person. And I saw the Vaughn brothers. And I thought, man, these two brothers are as good or better than any of those guys. You know, why aren't they famous? And the reason they weren't famous is because they stayed in Texas and kept playing dumpy little clubs. They didn't move to New New York or LA. So they were in what we call flyover country and they made a good living just playing Texas and like that. So they didn't feel a lot of pressure to go somewhere else. From, from day one, I just thought these guys are unbelievable. Why aren't they famous? And, and right. but eventually they did, they did become famous. But I, I just had that moment back then, back in 1977, you know. Yeah. Eric Clapton said the same type thing that, you know, he thought Jimmy and Stevie, of course, they had their two different sounds and the sibling rivalry, but that, you know, Stevie idolized Jimmy, but that they each kept each other really tight. Yes. You know, that was another thing. Uh, I don't mean to get off on this too much, but a lot of the other uh, works, I'll just do a broad brush, a lot of the other works about Stevie always kind of uh, portrayed Jimmy in a negative light, like he was the mean older brother. That's not what I saw. When I would see one of their gigs, they were always at each other's gigs. I saw the Thunderbirds one night in Houston. They were opening up for John Prine, and Stevie was there backstage to wish his brother good luck. And yeah. Just, I never, all this stuff people write about Jimmy being the mean older brother, I never saw that. You know, maybe they walked in on him the one time they had a fight you know, and thought, oh, they're that way all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, I had a younger brother, and we were very close. And, and if somebody walked in on us when we were having a fight, they would think I was the mean older brother. But I never saw any, like but now Roger says, there was no animosity, not a hint of animosity. They were each other's biggest fans, and Stevie did just idolize Jimmy. He worshipped the ground he walked on. You know, well, that's why like he became that. a guitar player, because because of Jimmy. And the, I love that story about little Stevie out on the front porch wanting to go with them when they were playing their gigs. And Jimmy would kind of chase him back up on the porch and run out to the car <laughs> so they could go. <laughs> that is adorable. Right. right. Well, that's that's all the truth because that's told by people who are there. We're yeah. not you know, relying on critic or expert or some you know ghostwriter or like that. But I, I never saw any kind of animal. I really wanted to uh, you know have that come through. That they, they really were a mutual admiration society. But there was a robbery. Each one was trying to maybe outdo the other a little bit on guitar. Sure. Like that. There, there was that. They were just two amazing guitar players who did stuff with the guitar I'd never seen done before. Well, and I love Jimmy talking about how cool Stratocasters were when he said, you know, was it a machine gun? Was it an ashtray? What was it? <laughs> right. And I had them there because back in the 70s, if you look, almost all the big British, you know, uh, super groups, Led Zeppelin and, sorry, Bad Company and people like that, they played the Gibson Les Paul. That was the kind of the 
the uh, the British blues rockers or, or British super groups. They played the Gibson last fall, but the, the Vaughn brothers both played a Stratocaster. And of course, Jimi Hendrix played a Stratocaster too. A few other people did too. I like having that little contrast between the two guitars because those are the two pinnacles of rock guitars. The, the Gibson Les Paul and the Fender Strat. Every major rock band used one of those two guitars. I really wanted to get his, his commentary on the Adam Tickle he did. <laughs> I love that. And I also, something I never knew, and I forgot, forgive me, who was talking about this in the film, but how incredibly strong Stevie Ray Vaughan's hands were that enabled him to play and make it look so easy. Right. That was Scott Ferris, who was in one of Stevie's first bands, Liberation. And he gives a great story in there about when they had to audition Stevie to play in their band. I don't want to ruin it, but it's, yeah. it's a great story. But he said that, that was uh, uh, some of the advice Stevie gave him. He said, you know, uh, you always practice your acoustic because it'll make your hands stronger. And yeah, he had really large hands, but they were both very strong hands. And Jimmy, the same way, neither one of them used any effect pedals. You know, like that. they got all their sound out of their hands by stretching strings and bending them and like that. And they played a Fender Strat plugged straight into a Fender amp. No no effects, no pedals, no, you know, fuzz tone and this stuff. It all came straight out of that guitar and out of their hands. And that was another reason I thought they were just pretty incredible. Of all the interview guests you have in the film, the one that took me off guard, and tell me if I'm saying his name correctly, was Stephen Tobolowski, an actor we all yeah, recognize. Stephen Tobolowski, he's mostly well known for his part of Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that he played with Stevie Ray in that band at 14 on the album A New High. Just hearing him talk about that, that blew me away. Right. Again, that goes back to I, friends of mine had shown me that annual from Kimball High School with Stephen Tobolowsky and Steve Ray Vaughn in the same band. Uh, Scott Ferris showed me that because he lived, uh, I've known Scott for a long time and he grew up in Oak Cliff. But again, these are stories I heard that I wanted to get. So I asked Stephen Tobolowsky to tell us about that. And so he talked about him being in the same band with Stevie Ray Vaughn. <laughs> Great story. I mean, killer, killer story. And then we move on to opening for Muddy Waters at Antone's and Albert King, that story. And again, not to give anything away, nobody got up and jammed with Albert King, but Stevie Ray did. Right. And and they literally had to, uh, Clifford Antone literally had to beat up on Albert King for like four nights in a row. And right. And finally in the last night, he says, okay. They had to wear him down. <laughs> right. Yeah. But Jimmy said, you know, nobody sits in with Albert King, you know, and he was just a big menacing, you know, black blues guitar player who just didn't put up with any BS. Uh, finally, Clifford Antone wore him down, you know, and, and he let Stevie get up there. And you're right, Stevie became one of the few people to be able to sit in with Albert King, and then they kind of formed a mutual admiration society, because again, all all great guitarists thoroughly respected the Vaughn brothers. Right. You know, they, if they saw them play, they said, these guys are special, you know, and they're doing stuff I can't do. And I love the part quickly about Clapton talking about when he got to Dallas and on the jukebox, everything was ZZ Top and just what heavy hitters they were. And then the song, of course, that Billy Gibbons put on one of their albums about the fabulous Thunderbirds. But when we get into the toll that alcohol and drugs took on Stevie Ray, I love that he was so talented and passionate. It never never took a toll on stage. No, and I will tell you that, you know, back in those days, we knew he had a, I don't know if we called it a problem. We just knew he was high all the time. And we just kind of like, okay, whatever. Because back then, everybody was getting high. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. And, so when he uh, would play, he would be just totally wasted, but he never missed a lick. I mean, and we just kind of accepted that or, or that that's what you get. You know, Stevie's going to show up wasted, but he's going to put on a perfect show. I never thought it detracted from his performance at all because it didn't. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, I didn't really see what the end game was. Of course, you got to remember, I was like 28 years old when all this was happening. And so you don't really think ahead, like, oh, this might harm him years from now. Right. We were, just, like, really, we were all just, we were all getting high and going to just enjoy music and all stuff. Or as one of his booking agents told me, he said, the way we look at it, it's a Stevie world and we're all lucky to be here. You know, right. As long as, as long as Stevie's getting the gigs and we're all making money, hey, let the good times roll. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Which, you know, has been to the detriment of so many artists. The person who was the catalyst to Stevie Ray getting sober due to Jimmy talking to him was Clapton. Now, I want everybody to watch the film and see what exactly happened, but I had no idea about that. Right. Eric Clapton is why Stevie Ray Vaughan got clean and sober. So, as we were showing the film, Clapton go had to go dry out and, and get sober because he had a problem with alcohol and yeah. drugs. He 
he was drinking heavily and he went and got sober. And then when he was called by Jimmy, he was the one that got Stevie Ray Vaughan to sober up. It's a pretty moving story. And I, again, I, I, I can't convey it over the phone line. You'll have to watch the film. Yeah. But Eric Clapton talks very honestly. And that was one thing I'll be completely frank with you. I was kind of shocked at how honest and candid all of our interviewers were. Me too. Uh, you know, yes. No, I was, when they were talking, I kept pinching myself saying, don't interrupt them. Shut up. Let him keep talking. Because they were really spilling their heart out you know, in front of the camera. And I was really kind of surprised at that. And several people have asked me, why was that? And I said, well, you know, I think, I don't know this, but I think it's because 31 years had passed since Stevie had died and enough time had passed so they could talk honestly about it, you know. Yeah. And we tried to stick a camera in front of them, you know, a year later or two years later. Nope. I don't think they would have done that. Uh -uh. But enough time had passed and they had lived life long enough to look back on it. And so... We were very fortunate, blessed, a God thing, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that they were so candid with us. And now that comes through. You'll watch the film. You can see this is honest stuff. Nobody's showing off for the camera. And there's no <laughs> script, right? They, Like you said, they are speaking from their heart. And you could tell that it's something that they haven't spoken of very much. And it seemed like it was cathartic for them to be talking that honestly and openly about it. Right. There may be an interview where Clapton talked about that somewhere, but I haven't found it. <laughs> no. It, it may be out there somewhere, but I've not found it yet. <laughs> no, me either. And the fact that Eric Clapton, and this is all I'm going to say about it, had only been sober a year when he went to see Stevie Ray in the hospital. And you've just got to watch the film to see how that affected Eric Clapton. The interviews with Nile Rogers were just amazing and just so many things about it. And so much at the Alpine Valley concert, Clapton saying that after Stevie Ray went on, he said, I just sat there watching him and I didn't want to go on. Eric Clapton did not want to follow Stevie Ray Vaughan. Right. And we've got it on camera. So we're not making this <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, no, he says that. He says, I was watching and thinking, I don't really want to go on after this. You know? <laughs> and, I, and I can understand it because when Stevie brought it, you know, when he and Jimmy brought it, they it was just like nothing you'd ever seen before. Yeah. And, and I want to say one thing about Nile Rodgers. I think Nile Rodgers is about the coolest dude I ever met. If you folks will Google him, he has worked with everybody, every major artist, he's produced their albums. Yeah. He's just got an ear for music and a way to bring out the best performances of people. And that dude can work. He produced an album, country and western artists. He's done them and rock and rollers. I mean, he's worked with everybody, but somehow he's able to get them to bring their best and get a sound that just really works. I just, I'm in total awe of the dude. I really am. Well, and excuse me for this, but he is a producing badass. That's just all there is to it. Oh, yes. Yeah. He produced Keith Urban's latest album, I believe. I mean, yeah. You, you go from working with David Bowie to Keith Urban, you know, I mean, good Lord, that, that's a pretty wide range there. And a lot of people don't realize this, but David Bowie's best-selling album of his entire career was Let's Dance, yeah. the album that Stevie Ray plays guitar on, you know, that, that says a lot right there. <laughs> well, yes, it does. And the fact that Stevie Ray had the gumption to tell David Bowie, nope, I'm not going out on tour. I have got to do this album. And that's when they did Texas Flood at Jack and Brown studio in L.A. Right. And, you know, at the time that happened, you know, Stevie was still getting pretty much waste all the time. We all thought he's made a cocaine decision. Right. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Why would you turn down David Bowie? You know, yeah. we all thought he lost. We all thought he was on drugs when he made that decision. But you know, it was the right one. Looking it was. Back on it, you know, it's one of those things where hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. You know, but, but that that was the right decision. But but I'm just telling you, myself and everybody else in the music industry, we thought he's lost his freaking mind. Yep. And you know, then of course it addresses the helicopter crash and that Jimmy was kind of honked off at Stevie Ray. He made that trip up there to see him and, and be there. And then Stevie Ray wanted to, he said, I've just got a head on back. So he said, I don't know why, but he just really was adamant about he needed to leave. And he said, I was kind of, you know, PO'd that I got there and then he left. I wanted to spend some time with him. And the way that Jimmy found out I had no idea about that phone call. I didn't either. And that goes back to what we're, I'm saying there. This is back when there's no cell phones right. and, and no internet. So it, it's a totally different world. And uh, I, and so he, I don't think I'm going to ruin it to tell anybody this, but Jimmy didn't know that Stevie was died in a helicopter crash till the next morning. Right. Jimmy goes back to the hotel and they call him. He said, we just saw him take off. We didn't know the thing crashed. You know, the concert's still going on. He didn't know that Stevie was dead till the next morning. You know, neither did Clapton, you know. So again, this is all that pre-cell phone, pre-internet era. Like mm -hmm. that when uh, you couldn't communicate instantaneously with anybody at any time. <laughs> right. And 
you have to watch the film, but the correlation with Stevie Ray dying and what that had in common with their father is chilling. And I'm not going to say any more about it. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, that was, yeah, that was, again, another thing I didn't really know uh-uh. what we were doing. That kind of gives you a different perspective, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, and I didn't know about Stevie Wonder being at Stevie Ray Vaughan's funeral and Jackson Brown talking about, and I hope it's okay that we talk about this, that he and Bonnie Raitt were just standing there at the funeral and Stevie Wonder said, come on, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. And that was off the cuff. That was not planned. Oh, oh no, they had not rehearsed that at all. They just, uh, they Stevie Wonder just leans over and says, okay, Amazing Grace, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and they, like Jackson Brown says, and he says, I didn't come to that funeral to sing. I had no idea we were going to sing. So that was just totally random, but it was a moment. You know, again, uh, one of the things that we, I'm talking about back then, you had to be there. Yeah. A uh, TV news crew captured that, and I was able to use that footage. So there actually was some video of that. Well, and I love Clapton talking about two years after he did that running gig at Royal Albert Hall, and he was like, man, how am I going to fill all these nights? Because it was like 27 nights or something like that. And he asked Jimmy Vaughn to come play, and he didn't realize that Jimmy Vaughn had not worked or been really out in two years since Stevie Ray Vaughn passed away. Way. It was just a musical idea. And I love what Jimmy said about he just finally realized <laughs> if I don't do this, I'm a chicken shit. Right. <laughs> That's right. Because, you know, you've been sitting at home for two years and Eric Clapton calls you and says, come on, we're getting the band together. You know, you yeah, think, I better do this. <laughs> like that. Again, more candid conversation, you know, stuff like that, that we were just very blessed to capture. Absolutely. I mean, I think the whole thing, the way it came together was, as we mentioned earlier, a God thing and just the openness and the accessibility to these artists that a lot of times they don't do interviews because they don't have to. Right. Back then, when I was a buddy, the record companies told them, you're going to do this interview because we want to sell records. Well, now they don't get squat from music. I mean, you can listen to all the music you want for free on YouTube or Spotify or whatever. And it, if anything, it's 99 cents. They're not selling albums for $7 or $8 anymore. Yeah. And they're not selling platinum albums. You know, they're not selling a million copies. Back then, the record companies told the artists, you have to talk to this guy because we want to, to sell records. Everything was to sell records, you know. Yeah. And so the, and so now you're right. They don't have to talk to you at all if they don't want to because it's not going to hurt their record sales. And it's certainly not going to hurt their concert gigs because everybody wants to see their heroes in concert. Yeah. And really – Concerts now are the only way they can really make a lot of money. It's all flipped upside down. It used to be they went on tour to support an album because mm-hmm. you would hear their songs and you'd go down to the record store and buy that record. Now you can hear the music all for free on YouTube, but when they come to town, oh, I'd like to see them. And now concert tickets, instead of being $7, are 70 and $100, you know, because that's the only way they can make money now. Well, I heard a thing the other day with all the concerts that are out there and they were talking about Taylor Swift and they said 2023 has been named the year of the $1,000 concert tickets and people are actually setting up GoFundMes to <laughs> raise money so they can buy concert tickets. Right. Well, they're mine. If I would show you some old ads from Buddy, well, we got, you know, Jackson Brown in concert, $5, you know, and uh, Led Zeppelin, $10. Yeah. You know, uh, like I said, back then, it uh, the only way you could hear music was to buy the record. If right. you heard a song on the radio or TV, you had to go to the record store and buy it. There was no other way to get it. Right. You know? And so... It was all it was all driven to get you down to that record store and buy that album. As it goes on, what Jimmy said he finally realized about Stevie Ray Vaughan passing away, and we're not you just gotta watch the film because the way he says it, like you said earlier, it's not gonna do justice if I tell you what he said. You need to see and hear him say it. And then talking about six strings down, the tribute to Stevie and just him performing some of it. It's just amazing. And then ending with the artwork that was put up in tribute to Jimmy and Stevie Ray and their talent and just a few blocks from their childhood home in Oak Cliff. And again, the correlation with their dad to where that artwork is. Yes. And I'll be honest with you, I still get chills every time I watch Jimmy play that acoustic version of Six Strings Down. I said to people, I said, how many people do you know that wrote a song about their dead brother? (laughs) And it was really good. It became a huge jazz hit, you know. Yeah. I said, I can't think of anyone who's done that, you know, uh, like that. But to me, that's a pretty moving part, because I didn't really know the story behind that song until he told it to us on camera. If y'all are listening right now, pull up Six Strings Down and listen to it, and then we see it on the film, you'll get a deep, deep background about how that song came to be. And, you know, Jimmy was the one who had to tell their mother about Stevie Ray passing away, and that that song actually brought her healing and closure, the words to that song. Right. Pretty strong verse in there you know see the voodoo 
new child stretched out his hand. Oh. I've, been waiting on, I've been waiting on you, brother. Welcome to the band. I know. You know Jesus, Mary, and Joseph been listening to your playing. Yes. I mean, that, to get a mental image of that. <laughs> yes. That's, that's pretty, pretty strong. <laughs> and then when he talks about putting the other blues players in there, and that especially helped his mother. And just, man, what a great film. Kirby, thank you so much for taking time. We're talking about Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan, Brothers in Blues, available on all the major streaming platforms. Just the most incredible, it goes past documentary. It's just the most beautiful and incredible film with, I would say, 90% of it is photos, music, and interviews and words that we have never heard before. And you have got to see it. Well, thank you so much. We're on every major streaming platform except Netflix. We're not on Netflix, so don't look there. But but everybody's got YouTube. You can buy it on YouTube. Okay. Amazon, Apple TV, iTunes. Kirby Warnock, I appreciate you so much taking the time. Now, I've got to ask you, I know this was a monumental project, but what's in the works coming up? Oh, man, I tell you what, after doing this, I'm never going to do another music <laughs> documentary. It took, it, took, it took us three years to get all the music clearances. I mean, the the music companies, they don't give that stuff away and yeah. they can't make money off records. They want you to pay their price for yeah. it. And it was just very hard to get all the clearances of those songs. But uh, next, I want to make some kind of a feature film, you know, is what I want to do. Something I don't want to get music clearances on and everything like that. I'd like to do maybe a Western, you know, because I live out in West Texas and I heard all these incredible stories from my father. You know, he grew up out in Fort Stockton and I'd like to get all those stories together and make a Western. Right now, this film's got legs. I want, I want to promote it as much as I can. Okay. It is so worth the watch and worth every penny. Man, looking forward to what you have next, but Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan, Brothers in Blues, everybody, you have, if you were even remotely a fan, you're going to be a super fan after you see this film. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kirby. Thank you so much for tuning in to Rock Talk with Jackie Neal. Feel free to like, subscribe, share, and leave us a review. The intro and outro music was written, composed, performed, and provided by Mike Neal from Deep Well Sound.